more and more people are attracted to Islam and because of they are embracing Islam. So many regions were conquered even during the Khilafat of Sayyidina Osman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala and despite the fact that possibly famous names were not there. But Alhamdulillah, great Mujahideen were also on the side of Hazrat Osman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala and and one is worthy of mentioning a very important character. In fact, it would not be right for me just to continue with the seal of Sayyidina Osman bin Affan, but until we have mentioned the name of this great, great Muslim general, whose name is Hazrat Ahnaf ibn Qais. What is his name? Hazrat Ahnaf ibn Qais. Alhamdulillah, we should be in touch with Islamic history. Very, very important. Ahnaf ibn Qais, a very powerful man. In fact, during the Khilafat of Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan, he played the most important role, a pivotal role. The entire eastern section of the Islamic Khilafat of the Muslim army was under his control. A young man, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had opened up many regions at the hands of Ahnaf ibn Qas. He went on and he conquered regions upon regions, lands upon lands, subhanallah, and giving it to uh, the Muslim Khalif, Hazrat Uthman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala, a very powerful man. Now this man was not a Sahabi. This man was not a Sahabi. But rather he was a, a senior Tabi'i. Now there were a lot of companions alive, of course, even at the time of Hazrat Uthman bin Affan, but this very high position was given to him. He was not even a Sahabi, but a Tabi'i. A Tabi'i is that man who has stayed in the company of Sahaba Kiram Ajma'in. And a senior ta- Tabi'i would mean the one who has stayed in the company of possibly at least one of the Khulafai Rashidin. Ahnaf ibn Qas was a man who stayed in the company of Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Uthman, and also Hazrat Ali, Ridwanullahi Ta'ala Alim Ajma'in. A very powerful man. It, 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 scholars have mentioned about his character that he was very, very humble. Very, very humble. But at the same time of a very dynamic personality. And you'll find generally that uh, great people have this quality in them. When you see them, they are very, very humble. But because of the level of taqwa, alhamdulillah, that is inside them, they have a very dynamic personality. And Ahnaf bin Qais was a similar man, a great Tabi'i. It is said that he would run away from fame, status and honor, but fame, status and honor would pursue him. This was the type of character that was given to Ahnaf bin Qais, gifted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many words of wisdom uttered by him, scholars have recorded many words of wisdom which he spoke to. In fact, when he came to selecting his own officers, he would look at four things. He would often say that if four things, four qualities are found in a person, then most definitely that man would be the leader of his community. And he said that the first quality is that his religious duty or his religious commitment would restrain him in a sense that the level of taqwa would be in him so that he does not cross the boundary and plunge into the zone of haram. So he must be a man who has taqwa and who has self-control. A man who understands and who has control. At the right time he knows what is halal and he knows what is haram. It doesn't mean that you're in Leicester, you're a good Muslim. And you go out on a holiday, you start... uh, failing your duties that are of farz to you and you miss your fajr or you miss your zohar or you're a different person when you're somewhere else a man must be a man of taqwa in all conditions so this is what Ahnaf ibn Qais said and then he said secondly he said he should be of a good lineage so that there is a lot of protection that is given to him of a sound family background and the third thing what he said is that he should be a man who has been gifted with wisdom. Wisdom guides a person. Now I spoke about this also 
today in Jumu'ah, wisdom is a great blessing, a na'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will find a lot of people have knowledge. A lot of people have knowledge. One is knowledge and one is hikmah, wisdom. How you apply the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And if you have knowledge and wisdom, subhanallah, a great man. That is why scholars have mentioned anyone who studies the Qur'an with sincerity, with taqwa, Allah opens the knowledge and the nur of the Qur'an and this man becomes a hakim. As Allah says, Yaseen wal Qur'an il hakim. The Qur'an makes a person into a hakim. That is why when a person becomes a da'i, the one who invites people towards Islam, the first ruling is Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikma bil hikma he must be a man who has a lot of intelligence knowledge and at the same time a man who is very wise these are important qualities in a person once Hazrat Hassan and Hussain radiallahu ta'ala anhuma saw an old man doing wuzu an old man doing wuzu and when they saw him doing wuzu, they noted that this man's failing to carry out some of the important sunan acts of wuzu. But then if they were to directly approach him, if Hassan radiallahu ta'ala an was to say, or Hazrat Hussain was to say, to someone who is much senior and older in age, he might take an offense to that. It's not easy. Nowadays in the society that we live in, people suffer from ageism and when you're too old uh, and when you're too young uh, you'll find that a lot of the people don't want to accept someone who's too young someone who's too young because you have senior people that are there um, this should not be the case subhanallah Hazrat Osama bin Zaid who was appointed by Hazrat Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, during the ra- last phase of the life of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam towards the northern section of Madinah to munawwara uh, to carry out jihad with the other tribes that were there he was only 18 years of age you had Hazrat Umar there you had Hazrat Khalid bin Walid there you had senior companions Hazrat Uthman all the Khulafai Rashidin you had the Ashray Mubashra that were there but Allah selects a, a young man who's only 18 years of age. And today when you look at our 18 year old youth, they won't even know how to read Surah Al-Fatiha properly. Inna lillahi wa inna ilihi rajum. Because after they finish madrasa, that is it. They don't want to touch the Quran. They have no understanding of Tajweed. They have no understanding of the Quran. They have no connection with the seerah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they are poisoned because of the society that we live in. The laptop becomes the Qur'an. The laptop becomes the Qur'an. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. So we have to be very very careful, alhamdulillah. And this is a great blessing that Allah has made namaz farz. It's an obligation. So that you have to stop whatever you're doing and spiritually connect yourself to Allah. Spiritually connect yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be prepared connect yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so wisdom is a great na'mah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all wisdom and so both of them grandsons of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looking at this old man doing wudu incorrectly and how do we approach him subhanallah both of them the brothers go to this man and they say the oh my dear father we want to see who is doing uh, wudu in accordance to the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we want you to be the judge between us. We want you to be the judge between us. And so both brothers, Hassan and Hussein, started doing, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, started doing wudu in front of this man. And so this man is watching how the two grandsons of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are doing wudu. And subhanallah, equally both the wudu were in accordance to the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When wudu was completed, this old man himself came and he confessed and he said, 
my son, your wuzu is, a, is in accordance to the sunnah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, you have corrected for me some of my mistakes. Jazakallah khair. Uh, this is wisdom. You could have approached that person in a different way, in a very, in a hard-hitting manner. What are you doing? It's against the sunnah. Or directly say to him, this is a mistake. And again, you can approach someone in a very sweet manner. And this is something we need to adopt in the society that we live in today. Even the husbands with their, with their partners, and the wife with the husband, and, and the parents with the children, and the imam with the musalli. I'm not too bad, am I? <laughs> huh? uh, if that is the case, you must tell me, of course. And the musalli with the imam. So we must have this, this love, subhanAllah. Of course, at the right time, even the doctors sometimes have to amputate some part of the body. It all depends. So, at some, in some cases, aggression is a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Hazrat Ahnaf ibn Qais said that wisdom that guides a person, and then he said, the fourth thing, he said, haya, modesty that guards a person. Modesty that guards a person. So these are the four things Ahnaf ibn Qais would look into a person if he was to appoint someone as his officer. Mm-hmm. Not the qualification, but he would look at the khuluk, the character. Mm-hmm. Subhanallah. And if you become shameless, and there is no modesty in you, you become desharam, fa inna lillahi wa inna ilihi raji'un, then you are not that bothered. You are not bothered of whatever the community will speak about you, good or bad, and you will continue. So these are the four qualities that he has mentioned. In fact, he would even say that good manners is the best thing you could inherit. Good manners is the best inheritance. And he said that good manners is expressed by good words. Good manners are expressed by good words. The words that come out from you. So this man, subhanAllah, he was a teacher in all subjects, in all disciplines. Not only was he a great mujahid, but also a great faqih and a great scholar of his time, a muhaddis of his time, a great tabi'i. He has narrated hadith from Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala, from Hazrat Uthman radiallahu ta'ala, and also from Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala. In fact, after the demise of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when many of the tribes were becoming murtad, apostating from Islam, he was firm and steadfast. And in fact, he gave a lot of strength to his tribe. A famous man, and it is said about Ahnaf ibn Qais, that he, might, he made hijrah to Madinatul Munawwara only to stay in the company of who? Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. And to be his student. Now brothers, you can imagine how difficult it is for anyone to be under Hazrat Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. His level of taqwa. And he stayed in his company for one year. And after one year, Hazrat Umar looked at him and said to him, Ahnaf, I have tested you. Ahnaf, I have tested you in your taqwa, in your Islam, in your character. And I see nothing but good in you. Allahu Akbar. This is Ahnaf ibn Qais being tested by Hazrat Umar ibn al-Khattab, I see nothing but good in you. Uh, imagine, Sahabai Kiram Ajma'een are alive, and Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an decides to make, to appoint Hazrat Ahnaf ibn Qais as a leader for the tribe or for the people of Basra. So he became the leader for the people of Basra. The main man, Ahnaf ibn Qais, the people of Basra knew him to be a great leader. And he said to Hazrat Abu Musa al-Ashri radiallahu ta'ala an al-Sahabi that whenever you need to take important decisions, make sure you consult with Ahnaf ibn Qais. Now Abu Musa al-Ashri is a Sahabi and Hazrat Ahnaf ibn Qais is a Tabi'i. A Sahabi is being told by Hazrat Umar ibn al-Khattab to consult to Ahnaf ibn Qais, rahmatullah alayhi. So a great man, a great man. Subhanallah, a very brave soldier, a great Muslim general, 
the entire eastern section of the Muslim empire all of the armies were under his control and he was the man in charge a very brave man it is said that he would not want to expose his men to danger but he would be the first one to expose himself to danger this was Sayyidina Ahnaf ibn Qais Rahmatullah alayhi and even radiyallahu ta'ala an Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate his position in this dunya, in the hereafter, in the kabar, in alam barzakh and also in Jannah. MashaAllah, another very important campaign during the Khilafat of Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan radiyallahu ta'ala an is the campaign of Cyprus. The campaign of Cyprus. Now, Hazrat, going back uh, to the Khilafat of Hazrat Umar radiyallahu ta'ala an just to explain to you uh, the connection of Hazrat Amir Muawiyah he was alive during the time of Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar and also Hazrat Uthman radiyallahu ta'ala an of course Hazrat Muawiyah radiyallahu ta'ala an sister Hazrat Umm Habiba was the wife of Rasulullah mm-hmm. sallallahu alayhi wa sallam remember Abu Sufyan was the enemy of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he had embraced Islam and Makkah al mukarramah was conquered so he is the son of Abu Sufyan Hazrat Muawiyah radiyallahu ta'ala Hazrat Muawiyah had urged Hazrat Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala and had put a lot of pressure on him that permission must be given to Hazrat Amir Muawiyah to mobilize a very powerful Muslim navy a very powerful Muslim Navy. But every time Hazrat Amir Muawiyah would put pressure, Hazrat Umar would say no. Hazrat Umar would say no. Until too much pressure was put on Hazrat Umar ibn al-Khattab. Hazrat Amir Muawiyah said that we have to uh, change our strategy. We have to change our strategy. Remember the Muslims were masters in fighting uh, on land and also in the desert. But they were not exposed to the seas and the ocean. Eventually, as the expansion of Muslim territory took place, Muslims had to rethink. And uh, there was this need to look at a different strategy to protect the entire Mediterranean coast that was there. And so, Hazrat Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an, then asked Hazrat Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As. Because Hazrat Umar was in Medina al munawwara and so he said to Amr ibn al-As, Amr, describe to me the seas that touch the Islamic border. <laughs> describe to me the seas and the ocean that touch the Islamic border. Now, Hazrat Amr ibn al-As radiallahu ta'ala an is on a mission to describe to him how the seas are. So he wrote in Arabic, and this is a translation. He said to Amir al muminin Amr ibn al-Khattab, Oh ho! You want me to describe the ocean, the seas? It is like riding on a very dangerous creature. It is like riding on a very dangerous creature. The waves. Now remember, we're not talking about 2009. We're talking about the time of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. And he said that it is like riding on a very dangerous creature. If, if it is calm, if it is, if the waves are calm, it would still scare you. Even if the waves, if the water is calm, it would still scare you. And if it moves, you would lose your mind. And if the waves come at you, you would lose your mind, you would lose your memory. Allahu Akbar. And then he said, that the sailors are like worms on a stick. (laughs) What did he say? That the sailors are like a worm on a, worms on a stick. If it tilts, they all drown. If it tilts, they all drown. If it is saved, you'd still be astonished. You'd still be astonished. Now, according to him, I mean, if they are saved, they are saved. But if it tilts, they all drown. When this description was given to Hazrat Umar ibn al-Khattab, Allahu Akbar, he said to Amir Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala an, that one Muslim is more dearer to me than the entire Byzantine Empire. Mm. One Muslim is more dearer to me than the entire Byzantine Empire. He said, no, not whilst I am alive. No Muslim navy. Uh, at the moment I have to concentrate 
subhanallah, in a lot of the military engagements, Muslims were fighting on land at that time. Eventually, when Hazrat Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an had passed away, then came Hazrat Uthman bin Affan, again same pressure put on him from Hazrat Amir Muawiyah. Amir Muawiyah, an incredible man. Honestly, it would take me six months of dars hadith if we touch on Hazrat Amir Muawiyah. What a man Hazrat Amir Muawiyah is. A great, great Sahabi of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Katibi again putting pressure on Hazrat Uthman that we, you have to uh, change, we have to change our strategy. And it is nothing big for the Muslims to engage in a military expedition by sea. So we consider what I am saying. Hazrat Uthman radiallahu ta'ala and gave it a lot of thought. And he said that I give you permission. But only if you feel it is safe for the Muslims to venture out in the sea. I give you permission. And one condition was that if you feel that it is so safe that you would be prepared to take with you on this expedition your wife. Your wife. And you would give a choice to the Muslim soldiers. No force that you have to come. A choice is given to them. That this is a, a complete different strategy adopted by the Muslims. So a choice must be given. So if you feel it is safe and you would take the women folks with you, only then I give permission. Hazrat Amir Muawiyah carefully thought about it and he said that most definitely I would take my wife. And he took his wife, Hazrat Fakhita. He took his wife, Hazrat Fakhita, with him on this expedition. Now this expedition was towards Cyprus. Now Cyprus is not Cyprus what we know today. Cyprus continued all the way uh, towards the region of Turkey and Kustuntunia, Istanbul was the capital of Cyprus at that time. Now what would happen is that that region was very vulnerable for the Muslims. Uh, they had to protect the seas because there was a possibility the Byzantine uh, Empire possessed a very powerful military navy and at any time could land towards the Mediterranean coast and where the borders are and in order to protect Palestine Hazrat Amir Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala an was concerned that Palestine must be protected and also Syria must be protected and later on also Egypt will be conquered and Egypt has to be protected also. So the, the Byzantines were using Cyprus as a launching pad. As a launching pad. Every time they were low, very low in supplies, they would go to <coughs> Cyprus and the Cypriots would fully equip them, give them food, give them all the provisions and in fact they were allies to the Byzantines. And Hazrat Amir Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala and took permission that we need to go first and take control of Cyprus. Hazrat Amir Muawiyah read the letter to the people, to the Muslims that was written by Hazrat Uthman. Hazrat Uthman gave them a choice. Subhanallah, thousands of people wanted to take part in this expedition. Subhanallah, just shows the love that people had for jihad to spread Islam. Not only men were recruited, but even women in the hundreds came. Women came, including the wife of Hazrat Amir Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala an. And one lady that must be mentioned is Hazrat Umm Haram. Hazrat Umm Haram. And this is something very, very important that we need to remember. Hazrat Umm Haram is a special lady. A lady who was married to Hazrat Ubada bin Samit radiallahu ta'ala an. Very often Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would visit the family and she would cook food for Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah's Nabi would do qailullah and rest at her house. So Hazrat Umm Haram, this lady who participated in this campaign of Cyprus, it is said that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once came to visit her and she prepared a meal for Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and after that Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rested. 
when he woke up, Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a smile on his face. So she said, Ya Rasulullah, why are you smiling today? And Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that, On the haram today I saw a dream. Nasun min ummati urizu alayya ghuzatan fi sabirillah yarkabuna sabaja hadha al-bahar. And he said that a dream was shown to me that a group of uh, um, a group of my ummah, a group of my ummah was shown to me who were traveling um, through the middle of the seas like kings on thrones, like kings on thrones, with the intention to wage jihad fi sabirillah, with the intention to wage. Jihad fi sabirillah, campaigning for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah's Nabi was smiling. So she said, Ya Rasulullah, make dua that I am amongst them. Make dua that I am amongst them. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lifted up his hands and made dua and he rested again. And then he fell asleep, again he woke up, again he started to smile, again. She said, Ya Rasulullah, you smile. Again, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated the entire dream to her. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, make dua that I am amongst the people of the dream that you have seen. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that you are one of them because I have seen you in my dream. Subhanallah. This was the prophecy uh, and the prediction of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Glad tidings that came true in the time of Hazrat Uthman radiyallahu ta'ala an when Hazrat Amir Muawiyah was the leader for the Muslims the first Muslim navy to be mobilized and alhamdulillah many many mujahideen were with, with Hazrat Amir Muawiyah and they had touched the soil of Cyprus for the first time subhanallah death comes to anyone at any time and everything is written uh, in your taqdeer, predestiny, fate has been written, death can come at any time. It is said that Hazrat Umm Haram saw the island of Cyprus and she was sitting on her conveyance, the animal, and all of a sudden uh, something happened to this uh, animal, the animal spooked and Hazrat Umm Haram fell to the ground. When she fell, she received a lot of head injury and in that injury she passed away. So until today, the grave of Hazrat Umm Haram is in that part of the region. Mm-hmm. So Cyprus has got a lot of rich Islamic history. Mm-hmm. A lot of rich Islamic history. Mm-hmm. And subhanAllah, the Muslims, they did not want to invade Cyprus, but wanted to take control mm-hmm. of Cyprus. And they met up with some of the people and said that we are not here to invade, but to invite you towards the worship of one Allah and to accept Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the final Nabi. These were very arrogant people, the Cypriots, and they closed the door, barricaded themselves, did not want to speak to the Muslims. SubhanAllah, again, if you do that to the Muslims, what would the Muslims do? Hazrat Amir Muawiyah immediately besieged uh, the capital, Kustum Tunya, and they had no choice but to surrender to the Muslims and they agreed to all of the terms to the Muslims all of the terms and Hazrat Amir Muawiyah said that you have to pay jizya to the Muslim khilafat 7200 dinars per year for the protection and that you can no longer be allies of the Byzantine Empire inshallah ta'ala we will continue from this in the next session of the hadith uh, just to continue uh, furthermore also with what happens to the Muslim army in also Syria and also Egypt. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa akhirlim. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina wa maulana Muhammadin nabiy al-umi wa ala alihi wa salim daslima. Allahumma taqabbal minna wa tuba alayna inna kanta tawabur rahim. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Sami'na wa ta'ana wa gufranaka rabbana wa ilayk al-masir. Bi rahmatika ya 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 rahmatika 